thank you for the privilege of coming in your presence again this evening. We thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit divine. Minister to us this evening. Open our ears to hear your word. And confirm this word in us. And this word bring forth fruit in our lives. In the name of Jesus, we destroy every weapon of the enemy that is ministered against us today. We cancel every evil work that Satan has assigned against this community of faith. May your word have free access to our hearts that nothing shall impede your word that is spoken. May your children hear your voice and not the voice of man. Give you the glory and the praise. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Just saying one to three. Tonight we're looking at family matters. Family matters, the Jesus factor. Thank you very much. Coming through now. All right. You know, sometimes we wish we can be choose our family. We have no choice in the family to which we belong. We are stuck with that name as long as we are upon the face of the earth. There are some families that have good names because they are good characters. There are just some families that when you hear the name, all it clutches up in a person is things that are not so good. There are some things about my family which have been changed. You know, you inherit certain legacies from your parents, and sometimes the grandparents, they may skip a generation. And these are things we cannot control. As a matter of fact, there's one thing all humanity has in common, and that is we inherited a sinful nature from Adam. And we wish we could change that, but we can't. No one can. But I thank God for giving us a way out. Amen. For giving us a way out of this Adamic image. Because God had a purpose way back in eternity that all who receive Jesus Christ shall be conformed into the image of his son and not in the image of Adam. Brothers and sisters, the most important thing for you to know in this life is who you really are in Jesus Christ. Your identity, your understanding of your identity determines exactly how you will live in this world. If I should ask anyone tonight, who are you? What would you tell me? Huh? A child of the king, but what does that mean? It's a good thing to say, we have a lot of phrases we use, but what does it mean? What does a child of the king look like? Huh? How does a child of the king live? Do I really live as a child of the king? Now that's a good answer, that's the right answer. We know the right words to say, but does that, do I really identify myself like that? 
When I walk the street and I engage with people, do I engage with people as do I am a child of the king? When someone come up against me, do I engage with that person as do I am a child of the king? Some of us are very proud of the name heritage that we have. And we try to live up to that heritage. And we do well. You know, many people believe, many of God's children here believe, that our identity is Seventh-day Adventist. Seventh-day Adventist is the religious community to which you belong. But that's not your identity. So who am I? That's the most important question you can answer in your life. Understanding who you are in Christ. And I tell you what, when we begin to understand who we are in Christ, then suddenly Adventism on this island will be a totally different picture. Amen. So when the people hear the word Seventh-day Adventist, they have a different picture. I want to go to this uh, handout that I gave you here yesterday. Because this is a very, very important subject we are going to look at tonight. So I'll take my time with it. God has given us all the opportunity to belong to his family. Let us read it in Ephesians chapter 1. See, I really don't want to stand behind the desk. I want to come close. Would I come close to you? In Ephesians chapter 1, we want to start there. Reading from verse 3, the Apostle Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in Christ in heavenly places, according as he hath chosen us in him, notice this, the spiritual blessings in heavenly places are in Christ. God chose us in Christ. That's a phrase that you would see in the New Testament over and over again. About 76 times this word, this phrase, in Christ is used. And of the 76 times, the Apostle Paul alone used it 73 times. It's important because it establishes identity. It establishes identity. You can live on the earth in either of two identities, either in Adam or in Christ. In Adam we are by default. You're born that way. That's who you are in Adam. But in Christ is a whole different matter. According as he had chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him with in love. Wow. Holy and without blame. And if God says I'm without blame, then who can blame me? What is the Bible talking about? Having predestinated. All that means is that God predetermined long in advance, before the world was even created, God made a choice. We spoke about it yesterday. God chose way back in eternity that we would be adopted as his children. Whoa. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children, by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Notice this, our adoption comes through Jesus Christ, not through Adam. 
So I belong to God because of Jesus. I do not belong to God because of Adam. Because Adam sold me to sin. Adam sold you to sin. Whenever I embrace my Adamic self more than my life in Christ, I will and I must sin. You know what I say? Because that's all Adam can do. Because there's a law of sin and death written in Adam. And the Bible says it's Christ. The spirit of life in Christ Jesus is what sets me free from the law of sin and death that I have in Adam. So stop fighting sin in the flesh. That's not where you fight. We have one fight in this world. Every other fight is a bad fight. Fight the good fight of faith. And that simply means I must believe everything God has done for me in Jesus Christ. I must believe that everything God has said about me in Jesus Christ, regardless of what I see. That's our struggle. We must fight only the good fight. Every other fight is a bad one. Fighting the good fight simply means I must live by every word of God. So God chose us and adopted us as his children. Verse 6 says, To the praise of the glory of his will, of his grace. Notice this. Is his grace doing grace? Wherein he had made us what? Accepted into what? What does that mean? In other words, we are now a part of his family. Do you consider yourself as a part of God's family? Huh? Do you? Do you really believe that? Let me say this for we live what we believe every day. We speak what we believe every day. Do I speak as do I belong to the family of God? Do I live as do I belong to the family of God? The Bible says in Romans 8 that the world is waiting for a manifestation of the children of God. Waiting to see the power and the grace of God demonstrated in the life of his children. So let's look at this together. So God made a provision for us to be a part of his family. How do we become a part of God's family? That's where we're going to begin tonight. God established us. He established our position in Christ before the foundation of the world. Before the foundation of the world, Christ was not flesh. He was spirit. And God established you. He established me in Christ before the foundation of the world. Christ was also eternal. And he still is. So the life that God established in Christ before the foundation of the world is eternal life. However, as I explained yesterday, that life is, does not become viable until a person receives Jesus Christ as a Savior and Lord and is now born again. See? Even though I existed in my father and in my grandfather, I did not become a viable human being until I was born out of my mother. In the same way, even though God has established a plan to save all humanity by making provision for them in Christ, unless these people have the opportunity to be born again, then that life that they have in Christ shall not become viable. So here we begin. God starts us up on a good foot. First Peter chapter 1, verse 23. This is the God of the second chance. Starting over with God of a second chance. God is not starting with Adam now and trying to fix him. See? 
God is not starting now with Adam and trying to fix Adam. Born again, life is not about fixing my Adamic flesh. Period. Born again, life is new life in Christ. Amen. You know, when a life is born, a real life comes into being. Born again is not a theological idea. When someone is born, a life comes into being. When someone is born again, a real life comes into being. Not a change of the old one, but a new one comes into being. It's the life of God that enters the believer. So the Bible says, 1 Peter 1, 23, Being born again, not of what? What does that mean? What is that referring to? Huh? The Adam, the flesh. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of in. Let's compare. Corruptible means bad, evil, subject to death, corruption of all kinds. Now, if the seed is corrupt, then whatsoever it produces will be corrupt. Because God has established a procreative law that says every seed produces after its kind. Now it goes both ways. If you start with a bad seed, you have bad crops. Now watch this for It's very important to get this. But when you're born again, you're starting with an incorruptible seed. What does that mean? Pure sin, sinless sin, cannot sin sin because there is no corruption in it. It cannot be corrupted. It is incorruptible. You must understand it. That's a different life. It is also eternal. It's imperishable. Watch this. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed, by what? By what? By what? <coughs> Let me see how many of these we have in the house tonight. Wait a minute. Let, let, let me make it plain. Come, 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 come here, my dear. Come. What's your name again? Riel. Riel was born of Halford Brown by Debbie Brown. Debbie? Okay. You follow what I'm saying? So Debbie is the... Watch this. Being born again, not a corruptible seed, but a incorruptible seed by the word of God. So the mother of your spirit life is the word of God. That's why you have to live by your mother. <laughs> Watch this. The seed is provided by the Holy Spirit. So when the seed Brothers and sisters, this is such a wonderful thing that God did for us. Amen. And we must take hold of it because your life will be totally transformed by it. Listen. It is the Spirit and the Word of God that give life, born again life. The woman does not provide the seed. 
The man provides the seed. But the woman provides the egg that houses the seed. That provides the seed an environment for it to grow. That is very important. So even though you're born again of incorruptible seed, God has provided an environment by which that seed will grow. And that's the word of God. So you cannot live a Christian life without feeding on the word. Every day. Every day. Every single day. Every single day. By the word of God, which what? Live it. So wait a minute. So if your mother, your spiritual mother, which is the word of God, lives and abides forever, what do you think of the child that she's producing? Live forever too. That's why Jesus says, the moment you believe and accept him, you have passed from death into life. Instantly. But it's faith to believe what the word says. And it's time we live what the word says. Believe it. Don't just carry it. Really believe it. And your life will be transparent. Something wonderful happens here. The word of God is your spiritual mother. You know when a woman is pregnant and the time is drawing near for that baby, God gave her two mammary glands that becomes full of milk. Is that right? So the word of God has two mammary glands full of milk. The Old Testament and the New Testament. <laughs> and the Bible says in 1 Peter 2 verse 2 as you want babies you must pray what? the same say what? milk of what? oh yeah. we must pray the milk of the world when I began sharing this with my mother after God started showing me these things, I came out of my wilderness experience with a whole lot of stuff. And for months I was just crying, 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 crying. My heart was broken. When I shared with my mother, she started to cry. She said, For all these years I'm serving God, and I'm not beginning to understand what this life is really all about. <coughs> I cried, I'd be driving up the highways and I'd be crying. And God had dried up my tears. As newborn babes, you must desire the sincere milk of the pure of the country of the that you may grow salvation. Wait a minute. Let's just talk about this for a little bit, could we? How often do you feel a newborn baby? Mothers, how often do you feel a newborn? Every two to four hours, right? Every two to four hours. Every two to four hours. See, what's this? You see, we say people are born again and bring them into the church. We teach them how to feel. See? Every two to four hours, you feel a new infant. What about if you feel that feel like infant? <coughs> Once a day. What will happen? Gas? Okay, okay. Let, 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 let's, what about once a week? What about all the Sabbath? <laughs> and we wonder why it is we struggle with sin. Why do we struggle with all type of habits? Our spiritual life in us is malnourished. The life is full of potential, divine potential, but the seed needs the environment and the blessings and the nutrients from the mother's milk, the word. So what are we doing? This is why I said to you at the beginning, when we start, it's a whole new era for us. The word of God will become the most precious thing to you. When you truly understand 
we will have grace. So my incorruptible seed life that was born of God, notice this, is incorruptible. So born again life is not sinful life. So I'm never born again a sinner. I still hear people in the church saying, well, I am a sinner being saved by grace. That's not true. That's not what the word of God says. You used to be a sinner when you was a child of Adam. You see, your body house, this house of your flesh, will always be sinful. And it's not about your house. It's about what God placed inside your house. Yeah. It is, it's incorruptible seed life. I want to make another point. Here's the babe. The babe must be fed. And a lot of God's children are suffering from what I call ASD, arrested spiritual development. Because they don't have milk. They're not feeding on the milk. They don't know what God says in the word about them. Because they're not searching the word to find out. I thought I knew. Until God showed me that I did not know. Now wait a minute. God has a message for this church. In Revelation chapter 3. The church that does not know that it does not know. Why believe in that it knows everything? You know we don't believe that message. We don't believe it. God says, you poor, wretched, miserable, blind, and naked. Not us. You better talk to the other churches out there. Not us. man who thinks that way, we cannot teach him anything. So what Jesus has to do? He's not going to come into his own church. Where is he? He's outside the church. You see, we have to allow the life of Christ to come in. The life of Adam has to be laid low. He's outside of the church knocking on the door. He said, anybody inside here, hear my voice. And open the door. Individually, people are opening the door of their lives to God. But cooperatively, the door is not open. And then why said, have you opened that door? I should have come a long time ago. See? We are still struggling with all kinds of fleshly stuff in the church. I'll tell you something. I say just as it is. Because I'm a comfortable. God. When a person is born again, when a baby is born again, when a baby is born, they feel a baby with milk. It's amazing what happens when a baby gets milk. They bought some booties for the baby two weeks ago, and two weeks time the booties are too small. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. It's amazing. Bones begin to grow, must become strong. Pretty soon that baby, that baby starts to creep and Turn over and all these kinds of things, right? Now, when a child is born, could that child walk? Could that child speak? Wait a minute. What do you think happens when you are born again? You know how to walk. You don't know how to speak. You don't know how to hear. You don't know how to see. This is very important. Because born again life does not see or hear, or walk, or talk, like born life. Very important. Born again life is divine life. When you ask me who I am, I give you the answer that God gave me. I was born from God, from above, and God is divine. So I am divine. Adam is called human. That's what Adam means, humankind. But when you're born again, you're not humankind, you're divine kind. Because you're born again of incorruptible sin. And you have to assume your identity. If you don't believe that, you'll continue to live as Adam's children. And listen what happens. Tell you what happens. But God doesn't expect me to be perfect. I'm only human. I 
life. God says, be you perfect? Because he gave you a perfect life in you that cannot be corrupted. Ephesians 5, 1 says, be ye imitators of God as his dear children. So we are able to imitate God. But we have to connect with the life of God within us for this to happen. And this is what this journey is about. In Adam, we bound up. So I'm not human. I am divine. Because I was born out of the divine. The word of God is divine. The incorruptible seed is also divine. So God gave me this privilege. I have a word mother and a God father. Praise God. Incorruptible seed. What should the Bible say about the seed? First John chapter 3 will say. He said every seed produces after its kind, right? That's what the Bible says. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Okay. Now, let's read 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. What does the Bible say? He that committed sin is of who? Ah. The devil is running humanity. Everything that's called human, the devil is running it because Adam sold it. The devil cannot run divinity. <laughs> Get it? For the devil sin that from the beginning, for this purpose the Son of God was made manifest that he might do what? Destroy, Destroy the works of the devil. Now let's go to verse 9. Two comparisons seen here. We see the sea of flesh, the sea of the serpent. Now look at the sea of the woman. Whosoever what does whosoever mean? Anyone. Whosoever believes, right? Whosoever is born of God, thou not commit sin. Why? What kind of seed is it? Incorruptible seed. For his seed, we made it bear. striving for one thing, one part of you, call your will, where you make a decision. You see, your will, your will. Now when you're born again, because you have lived so long in your natural 
natural life Adam, your will has been weakened by sin, and you are prone to make wrong decisions. I tell you this, as she starts to feed that baby, I was one for baby. And the thing that I wanted to do when I was small, I couldn't do because my mother would just put it on me. Right? But my father would put it on me. One thing I used to always want to do as a kid, my father, my mother would make this nice sweet bread. And you're, you're in the house and you're smelling the aroma of the sweet bread, and you wish you could go out there and pinch a piece. But dare you do that? No, you can't do that. My father was just coming from work and he'd, he'd go wash his hands and go right up in that kitchen and just take a knife and cut through that thing. <laughs> a big hump and walk up into his room and he's eating that thing and said, man, I can't wait for him to get big. <laughs> and you know what? I'm big now, I'm cutting my own skin. <laughs> but watch this. Let me, I'm, I'm giving you in a nutshell like before I explain all the things I have here on this paper. I'm giving you a nutshell what it's like. I buried both my mother and father. But the time came when the child became a man. And instead of they telling me what to do, I was telling them what to do. You know what I'm saying? My mother in law now lives with us. I tell her when to eat, when to go to bed, go to the restroom. I take her where she wants to go. Because now the child becomes the man. I'm telling you this for when you start feeding the life of God in you as you should, it will take charge over your flesh. It will grow up. I mean, your flesh wants to do something, that life of God in you will stand up. And after a while, as you grow in Christ, you see, you are growing up in Christ because that's the seed. You see, those desires are just gone because the life of Christ in you is standing firm. Because it's a strong for the nourishment of the world. You have to be careful where you feed your baby. What's the best way for a baby? Huh? What's the best milk for the baby? Mother's milk, right? Now we have baby formulas that we sometimes use. You know some mothers sometimes say, well, I, I want to try to keep my food a little bit after, after pregnancy. So I'm going to alternate between mother's or nature's milk and some baby formula. Now nothing is wrong with baby formula. You can use that sometimes. But the best milk for the baby is what? Say this to make a point. I believe that it might be the prophet of the church. <laughs> but that's not mother's milk. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Now you can use that milk. As a matter of fact, she said, if you were studying the word that we should, you would need her writings. Yeah. Is that right? Yes. But what people have done now, they have gone. Either or. You see, some are, are so now into what Ellen White said, people can quote and tell you all that Ellen White says, and they cannot tell you what Jesus said. They are quick to tell you what Mrs. White said. Okay, she said it. What did Jesus say? You don't know. And that's our mother. And it might be the same word. We can read other books. We can read other books, that's okay. So we're not throwing away the books. They use them as supplements. See? But you know what the main feeding source is? Jesus said it. You live by every word of God. God. Take time to feed your spirit and your struggle in this life is going to be what in let me say before you will not have to struggle. I'm going to show you something. 
Which one of these boys should I be? This one. What did he have to do to resemble you? Nothing. Nothing. Okay, so I'm ready in the gene. Four well, listen to this. You don't have to do a thing to resemble Jesus. Just feed the child. Amen. The seed is already in you. So the Bible says you are rooted in him. You see, God changed your root. You once were rooted in Adam, now you are rooted in Christ. A whole different root. So it's not about trying to make Adam behave like Christ. Can't happen. It's about going in the root of Christ and growing that root and that root feeds only on the word of God. So now we understand our life is spirit life. I have to learn anew as a babe. How does the spirit see? How does the spirit speak? How does the spirit man walk? Because he does not walk as flesh man walk. And so when people are baptized and they come into the church, we expect them to live straight. They can't. Because babies can't walk. They can't even speak. They will, they will carry after you by saying the things they hear you say. But they have not learned to speak from the Spirit yet. And when they fumble and they make mistakes, you know what we do? We put them out. We won't be putting out. See, it's going to put a whole new light on things. What are we putting out? Even though their flesh is fumbling and mumbling, the spirit life of God is still in them. And they never discovered it. They never discovered it. That's why the Lord had my life. God just broke my heart. I was weeping, 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 weeping. I couldn't stop. Every time I tried to stop it, like a hand was holding me right here. And I realized I was mourning for God's people. I was just mourning. But you don't understand what spirit life is. And we're looking at flesh and trying to make flesh go right. No matter what we do, flesh cannot go right. Because all flesh needs Jesus Christ. So here we are. God gave us this privilege to be a part of his family. I summarize the seed here for you. Whatsoever is born of God cannot sin. Because his seed remains in him and he cannot sin. So what sins then? At any given moment, I can step out of my Christ and get into my heart. You know that? I'll tell you something. As you start feeding your spirit, before you can make any wrong decision, your spirit will tell you, and you'll have a moment to decide where you want to go and what you want to do. Your spirit will tell you. And you'll decide whether you will step out of your Christ to do it because sin is always self-centered. Sin is always self-centered. Sin is never Christ-centered. It's never the Christ in you wanting to sin. It's the self in me that wants to sin. And the self is always coming from Adam, not from the incorruptible seed of Christ in me. And that's why God made a provision to say every sin. He didn't say when. But if. So if you slip out of your price sometimes, you've got to remember your position. And the more you feel, is the less you would say. You understand what I'm saying? Because your, your feet will be more steady. If you're feeble, and you're hardly feeding, your feet will not be steady in Christ. You have to be in the Word. And you're going to see some things happening in this church you have not seen before, because the Spirit of God <coughs> is going to transform you. Amen. Let me talk about the Jesus factor. Spirit life is something else, brothers and sisters. I want to write these two scriptures down because they are, they are not in this lesson, and I'm just, the Spirit is just bringing them to my attention. So I'm going to share them with you. <clears throat> God gave a covenant to Israel, called a new covenant. 
in Hebrews chapter 8, 10 to 12, he says, This is the new covenant I made. Right? We will do what? Put his law in our hearts and in our minds, right? And no one will have to teach his neighbors saying, Know the Lord, for they already know him. This is, a, this is an extension of the covenant that God made through Ezekiel, Ezekiel 36, 26. Where he says, A new spirit I put in you. And then I put my spirit inside of you. I cause you. You see that word there? He will cause you to walk in his ways. Because it's already to see. You have to try to. It's not my works, you see. It's a work of grace inside the believer. This is the covenant I'll make with Israel. After those days, said the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. Next verse, please. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor. So wait a minute. If nobody is teaching, how will you know? If nobody is teaching his neighbor or his brother, say no to the Lord. For all shall know me. How is that possible? Listen, for the seed that God places in us, the life of Jesus Christ, has everything in it already. His divine power has given unto us everything that pertains to life and godliness. 2 Peter 1 4. It's already in the seed. See, so that's why you're going to look into your son when you look like him. Okay? It's already in the seed. We will not have to teach anybody because the spirit life of Jesus in us already knows what it is. And as we read the word of God, the word of God locates it. And the spirit of God reveals it. So all will know without someone having to teach them. Another text. First John chapter 2 verse 27. First John chapter 2 verse 27. Speaks of the anointing. What's the anointing? First John 2 27. This anointing that you have in you. Okay, let me read it for you. Okay. But the anointing. <coughs> Which you what? Go to the second book. No, no, no. That's how you read the word. You do not read the Bible as you read other books. This is a secret book. You do not read the Bible as you read other books. There's a way to read the word of God. You don't speed it through. There are some people who have completed the Bible here and they can't tell you what the Bible says, right? So it's not about feeding to the Bible. It's feeding every word of God. There's an anointing that we receive. We have received it. When God downloaded his life in you, it's an anointing. And the Holy Spirit speaks to our spirit. According to Romans 8, 16. But the anointing which you have received, not which you will receive. You have received it. <laughs> Abide that way. Say, I have anointing in me. Say, I have anointing in me. <laughs> Say it as though you believe it. I have anointing in me. Because I received it from him. Because he is incorruptible seed and his anointing is now in me. See? I have anointing. Listen to me for. Every time you agree with the word of God. The word of God will come alive in you. But every time you use your intelligence to nullify the word of God, you do not benefit. So when I say to say what the word of God says, the word of God will never return to any boy. To always confess the word of God. So I have anointing in me 
because the word of God says so. So I can say it. I say what I say to you because I know the word of God says so. This anointing which you have received of him abided in you, and you need not that what? That any man what? But what? The same anointing. Teach you what? That's how you would know. That's how you would know. So you don't have to go to university to know that. You don't even have to go to theology to know that. You know what? What the Lord said to me one time? He said, Look at you. You have a doctorate, right? You go to study Peter. Sometimes you write a big dissertation, 300 and something pages long, on one statement that Peter made. And I give you a PhD. You come out with now as an intellectual. So you study the works of a fisherman. A fisherman wrote that. Yeah. But you see, he wrote it from anointing. And now you are studying what a fisherman wrote, and you are coming to say, now, you have a PhD, and you look at a fisherman. <laughs> huh? How foolish you can be. The anointing is what the teacher thinks. And it says, and it is what? The one find truth, that's what you get it. And it's no lie. Even as it has taught you, ye shall abide in him. Listen, folk, I told you as we began this week, it's going to be a new day for you. And all you have to do is to engage the life of God in you by reading the word. I cannot tell you everything I want to tell you in the time we have in for this whole week. I'm giving you bits and pieces to make some connection. It's like this. A woman has a child in her womb. Okay? She can sing to that child and speak to that child because one of the first organs that develop is the organ of hearing. And the most important organ in the body is your ears. Faith coming by, and hearing by. So you have to be careful what you hear. Because what you hear will influence what you think and what you say. That's why you got to have the word, hear the word, so you can think the word, speak the word, and live the word. Now, this is how this works. I'm saying some things to you here. You may not grasp everything one time, but I'm still saying it. You know why? Because your spirit knows everything that I'm saying. And I'm speaking very to your spirit. Yes. Now I'm letting the secret out. Because while you may forget, your spirit has forgotten. And sometimes you're doing something totally unrelated and it just pop in you. Yeah. Remember pastor said so and so? Yeah. Your spirit is your memory. And your spirit won't have Alzheimer's. <laughs> That's something of Adam, you see. So what, what, what we do, why say you have to repeat the word of God and say it aloud? Because when you speak, your spirit hears, and that's how faith grows, by hearing the word of God. You have to keep speaking the word, that's why you have to be in the word all the time. You are training your tongue to speak differently, because there's a lot of power in our tongue. And the more you speak the word to your spirit life, is the more your life will grow in faith. Faith is not something from your head where you try to well, I have a lot of faith. You can't work that way. Faith is spirit. All God's gifts come through the spiritual channel, never through natural channel. All God's gifts. So listen carefully. You know, a child, children are amazing. The child cannot talk, cannot speak, but the child has ears. And you keep speaking things. And the child is sharing those things. <clears throat> but the child can't talk. But the child will come and the child gets loose. And the child gets loose. The child starts saying things and you're wondering where the child gonna stop. Listen folks. 
You got to speak the word to your spirit. I'm telling you something. Because when your spirit gets loose, Jesus was talking to Peter and his disciples all the time. They didn't understand what he was saying at all. Their head couldn't understand it. He said, I have many things to say to you, and you can't understand it. When is the spirit comes? And one day, Peter found that loose and he started speaking. 3,000 people got baptized. What a bunch of men Jesus would choose to put the future of the kingdom. In whose hands you put the future of the kingdom? Look at these guys. Now, some of these guys will never get an office in the church. They have no promise. Even though Peter denied Jesus Christ, right? Jesus was reluctant. He said to Mary, Go tell my disciples and tell Peter. Jesus was not concerned with what's going on in their flesh. He was speaking to what's in their spirit. Peter had already received Jesus Christ. God said, Flesh and blood do not reveal that to you, remember? That before he, he, he denied Christ. You see, he was growing in the spirit all the time. Listening to the words of Jesus, listening to the words of Jesus, hearing the word, hearing the word, but didn't understand the word intellectually, but the spirit of the word. So when the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost and bore witness to his spirit. And then might make some statements. He says we'll be able to do the deeds of omnipotence, right? This is how it happens. Those of you in the computer, every day I pray, I say, Holy Spirit, download into my spirit the mind of God. Download the wisdom of God in me for today. I make the right choices. See? So I speak. And when I speak, I speak out of that wisdom. But you speak the word. Keep speaking the word. Listen to the word. This is what I do. I tell you what I do for me. I have a, a like MP3 player. And I download the word on it. And I listen to that word. I fall asleep with this in my head. So I wake up with this in my head. I'm driving on the highway. I want the word in me. Anything you say to me, I have to give you a word answer. I'll give you a word answer. Exercise it as well as he gave me the strength of it. This is the brothers and sisters. You have to keep speaking the word, and one day your tongue will get loose. And you start speaking things and seeing miracles happening. Yes, because the anointing is in you, and you have to know it. You have to confess it. Faith will come to fruit. Come to come to do manifestation of it. So here's what we have. We are part of the family of God. We are the body of Christ, right? Yeah. Now the body is not different to the head. If, if I, if Pastor Brown cars pull up in front of in front of your gate and all you see is his head, what do you say? Pastor Brown is here, right? Because they expect to see a body come through the head. <laughs> now hear this. You see, we say things, but you know, for we just mouth things off from the word of God, but we have not internalized what they mean. We are the body of Christ, and then Christ will do exactly what we will do because we are in the body. That's why the Bible says we are sitting in heavenly places because Christ is there. He is there. I am there too. But I'm also here. <laughs> it's hard for us to understand that, but that's spirit talk. This is the word of God, right? So the word of God is here, right? Ah, but the word of God is also in heaven. Christ is the word of God. So, the word can be in many places at the same time. So am I. I am here. I'm also in Christ in heavenly places. That's the power of spirit life. So what Christ did for us, we all have it in us already. All the things we are asking God for, we have it already. But see, we are asking as children of Adam. 
But God doesn't want to give his stuff to the children of Adam because they'll give it to the devil. That's what I'm saying to you. Christ got everything he asked for. Why? Why? Because his spirit was aligned with the spirit of God. You got to close. Let me make some points on this paper here for you now before the close. But remember this very important thing. The anointing is already in you. You receive it from God. You are a child of God now. The Bible says, now are we children of God. Is that right? Now. It will take me the rest of the week to explain what a child of God is. If you really believe you're a child of God, you start living as a child of God. And not as a child of man. Jesus was the son of man, but also the son of God, right? Now watch this. He knew he was the son of Mary and Joseph. God is sure he told them, look, I know I have a higher point. Right? Watch what God did. When Jesus was baptized, God made a transition. He said, this is my He is now assuming his role as the son of God. As the Messiah. He was not walking now as the Son of Man. He came now and is walking as the Son of God in the earth, in the body of a man. And that's why he was able to do the things that he did. He didn't do those things as the Son of Man, he did them as the Son of God. Listen to me. We are not going to do the things that God wants us to do as the Son of Men. You have to operate as the son of God. When I say son of God, I mean sons and daughters of God. So we've got to, we've got to assume our real identity. Then we're going to see the power of the life of God in us. And so, brothers and sisters, I did not go through all the scriptures on the page here, but I summarized a lot of things for you. I want you to take some time and go through the scriptures. When God, when you were born again, God created you anew. You don't have to try to be holy. You created a new holy. Let me give you two scriptures to establish that and we close. Uh, and there's so much to talk about. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We have read that before. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Reading from verse 14. It gets better. It gets better. Second Corinthians chapter 5. For the love of God constrained us or propels us. The love of God drives us. Because we thus judge, we come to the conclusion that if one died for all, then we'll all. So as far as God is concerned, we are dead. Adam is dead. So everything that you describe yourself by in the flesh, for God that's already dead. Did you get that? Everything we describe about ourselves in the flesh, for God that's already dead. But the devil wants us to believe that it's not dead so we can live in condemnation. That's the point. And no one can function with the power of God while living under condemnation. That's why the Bible says, there is therefore now no condemnation. If you know who you are, you will not walk in condemnation one day in your life. I'm telling you. What am I saying? You mean your flesh will not make mistakes? It may. But you are not condemned. You see, God has only double, double jeopardy here. Because Christ paid the price. So you don't have to pay the price for what Christ paid the price for. Christ paid the price for every sin you commit, that you will commit. He paid the price before you even were born, before I was even born. And we have to understand what the word of God is saying. The life of God in you cannot sin. The atom of you will sin. And God is not interested in the atom of us, for him that's dead. He's a Christian of the Christ in us. If one dies for all, then all dead. Read the next verse, please. And that he died for all, that 
somebody, whenever you accuse somebody, you're operating for the devil. Mercy. Any accusation. Mercy. Any accusation. Because Christ will never accuse anyone. Remember when, when Michael was contending with the devil for the body of Moses? He didn't even raise an accusation against Satan. He just rebuked him. The woman brought an adultery before him. He asked her, where are your accusers? When Adam sinned, God didn't accuse him. He asked him questions for self-discovery. We have to learn how to speak to the Christ in people. Because the inside of every one of these jars of clay is God's hidden treasure. Amen. And so we have to speak to it. And that's what I'm speaking to tonight. I'm speaking to God's life in you. There's a woman from, from a pastor's wife from a certain country, a certain island. For some strange reason, she contacted me and we began speaking. And she said, Pastor, you know the very first time you came to visit our church, I felt something jumping inside of me. He said, I know you're talking to me again and I feel this, this thing jumping in me. So your spirit is happy. She said, I'm so happy. I don't know what to do. When you speak to the Spirit of Christ in people, Christ will speak back to you. You see, you, you, cannot, you can never judge someone, you can never accuse somebody by, without stepping out of your Christ life. Accusation always comes from Adam, no matter what somebody did to you. When you start accusing, you are just as bad as that person. Because you have just placed yourself in condemnation. Because you are moving out of your position in Christ, who will not accuse the offender, and you put yourself now in the position of Satan, who is already waiting to accuse the offender. Remember Joshua the high priest? Standing before God? And Satan standing right beside him? And accusing him before God? And what did the angel say to him? I rebuke you! <clears throat> so I do not try to sink a brother or sister. I have to see the Christ in them. I must see the Christ of them and not the Adam of them. The devil wants us to see the Adam of them so he can put out the Adam in us. Get this, book. You cannot attack the Adam of someone without you getting an Adam yourself. I 
Until we start on that night. I can give you all night. But I won't do that. I won't do that. I want you to see these two points before we, before we close. So from henceforth, we don't recognize people according to what? The flesh. Paul is saying, once we once knew Christ according to the flesh, walking. Okay? And they saw him in the flesh. You don't understand him. But he says from now on, from henceforth, we know him that way, no more. This whole life called Christian is a spirit experience. It's not a flesh experience. God moved it out of the realms of flesh because the devil has conquered flesh. And so totally in the realm of spirit. So from now on, from tonight, we don't recognize people according to their flesh. Hmm. And when you start speaking to the Christ, you see what happens to them. You start seeing the best coming out of them, and not the worst. Mm -hmm. If you speak to the, to the devil in them, or to the flesh in them, all you get is more flesh. Mm -hmm. And I tell you something, you want to heal your relationships at home? Watch this. My wife and I have fun with this all the time. If uh, she's unhappy about something, and she comes to me, I ask her, where are you? And she asks her, okay, so stop. Am I coming in my Adam, or am I coming in my Christ? <laughs> See the question God asks Adam? Where are you? When somebody offends you, you go to them and say, sister, where are you? Is this your brother or sister you're talking to? Where are you? Are you the other one in Christ? <laughs> what? What am I using? The word of God. See? The word of God. And I'll tell you what happens. When I say to my wife, where are you? <laughs> she breaks out a smile. Because she knows exactly what I'm saying. Then I say something like, uh, Do you want my Adam to answer? You want my Christ to answer? <laughs> That's the end of the argument. You understand? So you have that person to center himself. I said, We are not ready for this conversation. Because I get to Adam where he belongs and come to me by Christ. So you can talk about this thing Christ to Christ. Yeah. Somebody asked a question about the young people yesterday. If this life in Christ is going to affect their relationship as young people growing up, no, this gives them their center. They look for people who have the same center. If a person doesn't have Christ as your center, it's not a person for you. Yeah. It's easy, it makes life very simple. If Christ is not your center, we can't relate. Your spirit will let you know right away. Your spirit will let you know, and your spirit is always right. Your spirit speaks to the voice of conscience. That's one of the functions of spirit. So, we know the man after the flesh. One more text. I, I tell you, I spoke of two texts. So, God, you are no longer flesh, but spirit. If any man is in Christ, that verse, the next verse says that. If any man is in Christ, he's what? All things are, behold, some things have become new. So if all things become new, God is not working with Adam. He's working with a new man. And let's look at the new man text. Uh, go to uh, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. When you're finished, we're going to put your life in the right place. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4, reading from verse 23. Reading from verse 23. <coughs> the Bible says, Be renewed where? You're talking about restricting, right? This is what's going on right now. I'm restricting your mind. So you have to think because you know what? 
you have the mind of Christ in you. The Bible says so. First Corinthians 2 16, you could read it when you go home. We have the mind of Christ because that's the seed in us. So you have to restrict your mind and start allowing the mind of Christ to function. Okay. We will use the spirit of your mind. Tomorrow I'm going to explain that text some more. How does the mind work? Our mind works this way. It is fed by the five senses, and based on what is fed into it, it processes those things and makes decisions. Okay? But the spirit mind doesn't work that way. What the spirit sees does not depend on what's in your vision. What the spirit hears is not what comes through your ears. You see, you don't see things as they are. You see things as you are. You see things as we are. If I have nothing but hatred in my heart for you, everything I see about you is bad. Because we see things as we are on the inside. We hear as we are too on the inside. See? So I'll take some time tomorrow to explain that text. But we have to be renewed in the spirit of our mind, the way our mind works. Because the mind of the spirit is guided only by the word of God. So what I see does not depend on what's in front of my line of vision, but what the word of God said about it. So if I look at that door, and that door say, well, it has a red banner on it, and the word of God says, no, that banner is pink. Doesn't matter what I see in my natural eyes, I have to say what the word of God says. <coughs> I'll explain some more about that. I'll show you why it's so. Okay. Next verse. Renew the spirit of your mind. Put off. Put off. Verse 24. Put off concerning. Verse 24 of Ephesians 4. And you put on what? What? The new man. That's the inner man. Watch this. Which. After God. What does that mean? Wait, 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 wait a minute. Which after God? What does that mean? It means in the likeness of God. Which in the likeness of God is created out. And what? So I don't have to try to be holy. It is created that way. Because I'm born again of incorruptible seed. See, try not to go, I'm going to do this. That's why salvation is not by works. God did it already. When Christ said it's finished, it's done. So we have this righteous life, a complete package. I was created in righteousness and true holiness. Chapter 2, verse 10 says, We are created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God ordained beforehand that we should walk in. Created in Christ Jesus, not in Adam. So God did a new thing. And it's time we understand what the new thing is. It's not about my Adam man now, it's about my Christ man. The one that God created, holy and righteous. The one that is incorruptible. The one that cannot even sin. So it's time we start feeding that life to so live the way God wants us to live. Because Adam will always sin. The life of God in you cannot sin. Every time we sin, we step out of that life to please our flesh. So we start to feed the life, we become strong. As we become strong, we will conquer Adam. We walk in victory, start seeing ourselves as we should see ourselves. Start seeing one another as we should see one another. Because I tell you this, the Bible says, any man who is joined to Christ is one spirit with him. If I'm joined to Christ, I'm one spirit with Christ. If you are joined to Christ, you are one spirit with Christ. And that means you and me, one spirit. That's where true unity comes from. Unity is not a thing of the flesh. That's why the church is not united. Because flesh can never come together. I'm telling you, we get our committees and we say where we're going to pray for the Holy Spirit and we're going to make, we're going to choose this and choose that. Flesh could never come together. The unity that Christ is speaking is unity of spirit. The one spirit that unites us all in Christ. 
when we start to recognize ourselves the way God recognizes us, then we will see true unity in the church, and the church of God will go somewhere. God bless you tonight. Let's come again tomorrow evening. We have a lot to talk about. God bless you.